chapter eleven of lincoln the lawyer this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org lincoln the lawyer by frederick trevor hill chapter eleven early success in the courts lincoln had served four terms in the state legislature and had once been a formidable candidate for speaker of that body before his partnership with stuart terminated doubtless he could have held the office indefinitely had he chosen to do so but there was neither glory nor profit in the work at that particular period of illinois history and for the time being he had obtained all the legislative experience he required moreover his ambition was beginning to take a wider range and his name had been seriously mentioned for the governorship on more than one occasion this and the fact of his contemplated marriage decided him to retire from politics and devote himself exclusively to the practice of his profession his four years association with stuart had given him a fair start in the law and he had enlarged his acquaintance and experience by travelling the circuit on every possible occasion in those days lawyers in active practice spent a great part of their time following the local judges on horseback or afoot from one town to another journeying in small parties and stopping at the same taverns like a company of players on the road some of the leaders like judge logan had cases to try in the various villages and towns on the route but others picked up business on the way and from all accounts the pickings must sometimes have been painfully lean for douglas's fees on one trip amounted only to five dollars and his was an unusually magnetic personality there was hardship and discomfort in this work but even in those very early days when the roads were almost impassable and the hotel accommodations belied the name the life had its peculiar charms for the members of the bar were persons of no little distinction in the eyes of the country villagers and the advent of the nomadic court was the red-letter day of the country calendars riding and tramping the circuit month after month brought lincoln into close touch with almost all the local members of his profession and he took high rank among them almost from the start the nature of his success at this early period is however a subject of much misapprehension most of the biographies give the impression that his associates appreciated him as an entertaining unselfish companion but did not consider him very seriously as a lawyer but good nature generosity and unselfishness do not necessarily insure respect unless a man has the power to command it and that power lincoln most certainly possessed there is a story that he used to be sent ahead as a scout when the rivers were swollen to test the fords with his long legs and doubtless it is true but there is another story that he once interrupted a too personal debate as to the proper length for a man's legs by remarking i should think they ought to be long enough to reach from your body to the ground a quiet retort which is said to have put some of the debaters in the air it was in the courts however that lincoln's nature and disposition showed to best advantage and it was there that he won his most enduring popularity and his first real recognition lawyers frequently refer to each other as brothers but there is very little real fraternity in the profession the sharp personal collisions inevitable in litigation bruise and jar the contestants no matter how hardened they may be and the man who emerges from the fray with no prejudice against his opponent and without having given the least offence possesses a remarkable temperament and such a man was abraham lincoln he knew how to try a case without making it a personal issue between counsel he could utter effective replies without insulting his opponent and during all his practice he never made an enemy in the ranks of the profession no one but a lawyer can appreciate what this means but it requires generosity patience tact courtesy firmness courage self-control and a big-mindedness which few men possess yet day after day and year after year lincoln met all sorts and conditions of lawyers at a time when they were all young ambitious and keen to succeed without embittering any one or forfeiting his self-respect 
not many members of the profession can show an equal record certainly none of the springfield bar has left a similar reputation that lincoln's experience in the courts guided his conduct in the political arena and in the hard-fought field of statesmanship cannot reasonably be questioned no public man in this country ever engaged in more heated controversies than he none was ever subjected to such bitter taunts or suffered such provocation yet after years of the fiercest political warfare and a duel of debate unsurpassed in the history of the world his most zealous opponent was able to side with him in the hour of national peril and when he took the oath of office as president of the united states that same bitter rival and unsuccessful candidate for the mighty office stood by him and held his capacious hat nor was douglas the only one of his competitors who harbored no resentment in the hour of defeat seward the ambition of whose life was crushed when lincoln was nominated and who accepted office under the rail splitter only to save the country had no cheap retorts to forget when he came to acknowledge his adversary as the best man of us all and to-day the south can find no word of offence in all the utterances of the most tireless advocate of emancipation and the union it may be claimed however that lincoln's early reputation as a fair clean practitioner does not prove that he was regarded seriously as a lawyer when he first practised on the circuit and of course it does not but there is very positive proof of his professional recognition in the fact that when his association with stuart ended stephen logan the leading lawyer of the circuit if not of the state a former judge and one of the canniest business men at the bar singled him out from all his contemporaries and offered him a partnership End of chapter eleven chapter twelve of lincoln the lawyer this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org lincoln the lawyer by frederick trevor hill chapter twelve a notable partnership the story of lincoln's professional life might fairly be said to date from his association with judge logan for although he had already seen four years of practice his experience had been mainly preparatory and whatever law he knew he had taught himself without competent guidance or control his new partner however possessed not only a strong individuality but also a positive genius for developing legal talents and his example and instruction undoubtedly had an immediate and lasting influence upon lincoln's subsequent career stephen trigg logan was like his partner a native of kentucky but when he moved to illinois he was thirty-two years of age and he had been commonwealth attorney in his own state for ten years before he opened an office in springfield not only was he better equipped by education and training than most of the illinois practitioners but he was unusually well endowed by nature for the practice of his profession and he speedily took high rank at the bar of illinois indeed such was his reputation for ability and learning that he was appointed judge of the fifth circuit less than three years after his arrival at springfield but the judicial salary seven hundred and fifty dollars a year was wholly inadequate for a man of his calibre and becoming restless under this pecuniary sacrifice he resigned in eighteen thirty seven after two years service on the bench his unquestioned leadership of the bar dates from this return to practice and for many years afterward his sway was almost absolute in the third volume of the illinois supreme court reports his name appears in connection with no less than twenty-six appeals an unprecedented record for those times showing that he was retained on one side or the other of almost every important matter in the courts these facts demonstrate the extent and value of his practice and there is every reason to believe he had the whole bar to choose from when he suggested a partnership to lincoln in the spring of eighteen forty one it could not have been for his social qualities that logan chose his man and he certainly could not have coveted the small personal clientage which lincoln had secured during his apprentice years neither is it at all probable that he allowed any question of friendship to enter into his business calculations 
doubtless he liked the young man and found his company agreeable but there was a strong mixture of scotch blood in the judge's veins and his eyes very rarely wandered from the main chance he wanted an assistant capable of helping him with his steadily increasing legal work and the explanation of his choice was obvious he believed that lincoln had in him the makings of an able lawyer and he instinctively recognized promising legal material in the rough no less than seven distinguished members of the bar and statesmen of repute four united states senators and three governors of states were developed in the same office in later years and their careers testified to the powerful influence of their preceptor and his faculty for discovering latent talent logan's recognition of lincoln's qualifications was not however wholly divination his attention had been first attracted to the young man by a very sensible speech which he had delivered during his earliest political canvass and when he was admitted to practice the judge was on the bench and doubtless heard his maiden efforts at the bar later he frequently met him in practice on the circuit and received the best possible proof of his legal aptitudes for in the fourth volume of illinois reports we find him opposed to his future partner in at least three appeals from cases tried as early as eighteen thirty nine and in all of them lincoln was the victor moreover one of these cases bailey v cromwell for illinois seventy one involved an important principle and was otherwise calculated to inspire each man to his very best effort although neither could possibly have dreamed that it was to have a place in history as the first contest touching slavery in which the great emancipator was engaged this case grew out of a promissory note made by one bailey to one cromwell in payment of the purchase price of a negro girl named nance when the note matured the maker declined to pay it on the ground that nance was not a slave and the trial turned entirely upon this point lincoln was retained by bailey and a hot fight followed in which lincoln was beaten but he immediately appealed to the supreme court which sustained his contention and reversing the lower court declared the girl free except in the matter of their legal qualities however the new associates were a strangely assorted pair there was only nine years difference in their ages but logan had been in practice for at least fifteen years when lincoln was admitted to the bar and as all his powers were matured before lincoln's began to develop he appeared much older and in temperament the two men were hopelessly apart logan was a formal precise technical attorney who read blackstone's commentaries from beginning to end at least once every year until he was sixty and whose shrewd hard face and keen eyes bespoke the man of business he was orderly and methodical in his habits careful and painstaking in all matters of detail highly moral with an old-fashioned lawyer's sense of morality industrious to a fault ambitious to make money and wholly absorbed in the practice of his profession with such a man abraham lincoln of course had little in common for he himself was easy-going unsystematic and without the slightest inclination for wealth wealth he observed is simply a superfluity of things we don't need and his indifference to the commercial advantages of the legal profession must have amazed his associate who never lost sight of them and died a rich man but though he did not care to make money lincoln was exceedingly ambitious to make a name for himself and realizing his own shortcomings as a lawyer he studied the methods of his experienced partner with the closest attention until he came under logan's influence he had practised in the laziest possible fashion making virtually no preparation for his cases and relying on his wits and the inspiration of the moment to carry the jury with him it would have been impossible for any man to accomplish much by such methods and lincoln's mental process was particularly ill-adapted for haphazard work his mind acted slowly and although he could make a quick reply upon occasion he required time to do himself full justice either in the courts or on the platform whether logan told him this in so many words or whether he discovered it for himself is of little moment but it is certain that he soon began to adopt his partner's methods studying his cases with the utmost care and diligently examining the law this training immediately showed itself in his work instead of being occasionally dangerous he soon became 
a formidable opponent whenever he believed in a cause he was too broad-minded for the blind partisanship of the average small attorney and instinctively looked on both sides of each question but it was doubtless logan who showed him the tactical advantage of knowing his adversary's case as thoroughly as he knew his own and as a result we have his own testimony that in all his practice at the bar he was never once surprised by the strength of his opponent's cause and often found it much weaker than he had hoped it is only necessary to recall a few episodes in lincoln's public career to realize how this training served him in time of need when captain wilkes stopped the trent on the high seas and removed the confederate envoys mason and slidell from the protection of the english flag lincoln was at first inclined to take the popular view of the matter but he calmly weighed the angry protest of the mother country argued her case in his own mind and not only saw that she was right but also shrewdly noted the tactical advantage of submission which he quietly pointed out in the most significant words we must stick to american principles concerning the rights of neutrals he remarked we fought great britain for insisting by theory and practice on the right to do precisely what captain wilkes has done if great britain shall now protest against the act and demand slidell and mason we must give them up and apologize for the act as a violation of our own doctrines and thus forever bind her over to keep the peace in relation to neutrals and so acknowledge that she has been wrong for sixty years again it was his knowledge of his opponent's armor which made him the most dangerous debater of the slavery issue abolitionists ranted and rashly accused the southerners of high crimes and misdemeanors of which they were wholly innocent lincoln learned the pro-slavery arguments stated them fairly analyzed them pitilessly turned them against their sponsors and convicted them out of their own mouths it was this great legal trait acquired and cultivated in logan's office that douglas had in mind when he exclaimed that lincoln had given him more trouble than all the abolitionists put together logan did not succeed in teaching his young partner to be a technical lawyer but he did undoubtedly show him the tactical value of procedure and it will be seen in another chapter that he occasionally availed himself of this knowledge although he never practised by rule of thumb in the matter of strategy he needed no instruction and his knowledge of human nature was vastly superior to logan's moreover the judge's sense of humour was somewhat deficient and lincoln once took an amusing advantage of this when he was practising against him before a jury on the circuit logan was dignity itself on such occasions but orderly as he was in most matters he seldom wore a necktie and was otherwise careless about his dress and lincoln knowing his man proceeded to unhorse him as soon as he addressed the jury gentlemen he began you must be careful and not permit yourselves to be overborne by the eloquence of the counsel for the defence judge logan i know is an effective lawyer i have met him too often to doubt that but shrewd and careful though he be still he is sometimes wrong since this trial began i have discovered that with all his caution and fastidiousness he hasn't knowledge enough to put his shirt on right logan turned crimson with embarrassment and the jurors burst into a roar of laughter as they discovered that the discomfited advocate was wearing the garment in question with the plaided bosom behind and for the rest of that trial logan was not effective against his former partner End of chapter twelve chapter thirteen of lincoln the lawyer this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org lincoln the lawyer by frederick trevor hill chapter thirteen judge logan and lincoln the terms of lincoln's partnership with judge logan are not known but it may reasonably be inferred that the junior member of the firm received only a small percentage of the fees for the business was almost entirely logan's and he was not by nature over generous 
indeed he had quarrelled with his former partner the brilliant orator edward dickinson baker on monetary matters and it is probable that there were few members of the bar who would have been as tractable as lincoln on the question of compensation certainly his style of living at that period indicated a very slender revenue considering the standing of the firm for even after his marriage with miss mary todd in november eighteen hundred and forty two he and his wife were not able to keep house but lived at the globe tavern where their room and board cost only four dollars a week and still later in the partnership he wrote that he could not accept an invitation to visit kentucky because he was so poor and made so little headway that he dropped back in a month of idleness as much as he gained in a year's sewing during all this time however the practice of the firm was steadily increasing and logan was becoming rich so it is fair to assume that lincoln was not receiving the lion's share of the profits it would have been surprising if business had not been prosperous for the partners worked together in entire harmony and springfield was at that time the centre of all things legal in illinois not only were the united states courts located there but the county court the circuit court and the supreme court the tribunal of last resort and the state legislature likewise held their sessions in the city and the indications are that the firm reaped a rich harvest from all these fields of legal endeavor success in the courts is not an infallible criterion of legal ability but it is an interesting fact that lincoln argued no less than fourteen appeals before the supreme court at the december term of eighteen hundred and forty one and succeeded in all of them but four a record which was not surpassed even by logan himself and between them the partners well nigh monopolized that court at the terms of eighteen hundred and forty two to three in that period they argued twenty-four final appeals and won all of them but seven a fact which not only indicates the extent of their practice but affords a fair inference of their success in other courts under the circumstances it is not surprising that lincoln gave little attention to politics during his partnership with logan though he did not altogether withdraw from public life the mention of his name for the governorship in eighteen hundred and forty one had been serious enough to call for a semi-official declination but there was no organized effort made to induce him to accept the nomination and the subject was dropped despite his close attention to business he was nevertheless more or less active in the councils of the whig party during the first two years of his association with logan and in eighteen hundred and forty three he became chairman of the local convention drew the political platform and otherwise manifested keen interest in party matters at the same time becoming an active candidate for the congressional nomination his most formidable rival for this honor was baker logan's former partner but neither man was strong enough to carry the convention and john j hardin another prominent member of the bar was named and elected the following year baker and lincoln were again mentioned for the same office but lincoln refused to contest the place with his friend and fellow-member of the bar who had long set his heart upon obtaining the prize and to whom defeat would have brought great bitterness indeed baker's political ambitions were almost boundless and in after years judge davis used to tell a story about him to the effect that when he first read the constitution of the united states and discovered that no one but a native american could be president he burst into tears bewailing the fact that he was ineligible having been born in england largely as a result of lincoln's withdrawal baker received 
the coveted nomination and was subsequently elected to congress afterward becoming the leader of the california bar and united states senator from oregon there was certainly a strange fatality about these early congressional contests for each of the three friendly competitors died for his country in the order of his election hardin gallantly leading his troops in a charge at the battle of buena vista in the mexican war baker while commanding his regiment at the disastrous battle of ball's bluff in eighteen hundred and sixty one and lincoln at the head of the nation there is reason to suppose that logan knowing his partner's deficiencies in the law originally intended to utilize his talents as a jury advocate but after lincoln began to study in earnest he developed other qualities which made him quite as effective with the court as he was with the jury and the two men were thereafter constantly together in all sorts of legal work he would study out his case and make about as much of it as any one logan remarked speaking of his partner many years afterward his ambition as a lawyer increased he grew constantly by close study of each case as it came up he got to be quite a formidable lawyer it has been stated that under logan's tutelage lincoln became a case lawyer but this is not true if a case lawyer be one who has at his tongue's end all the precedents affecting any given state of facts and who is lost unless his legal trail is plainly blazed but if the term describes one who makes no excursions into the field of general legal knowledge and is not concerned with its theories and philosophy then lincoln may properly be described as a case lawyer he met each problem as it presented itself attempting to do only one thing at a time concentrating the whole power of his mind upon the subject in hand until he mastered it and never forgetting any item of information when once acquired his mind he remarked was like a piece of steel very hard to scratch but almost impossible to free of any mark once made upon it he did not trouble himself to analyze the subtleties and labored profundities of the law and never made the slightest pretense to academic knowledge for real scholarship he had of course a profound respect but the pseudo-learning often displayed in the courts only amused him on one occasion a lawyer against whom he was practicing quoted a latin maxim and then either to impress his hearers or to embarrass his adversary added is not that so mr lincoln if that is latin lincoln responded dryly i think you had better call another witness while logan and lincoln were practising together certain changes were made in the judiciary and among the new judges elected by the legislature was stephen arnold douglas then in his twenty-eighth year judge douglas presided over the fifth circuit and lincoln's practice was almost entirely in the eighth but in those days the circuit judges as a body formed the supreme appellate court and lincoln must have argued many cases before his future rival for senatorial and presidential honors and in one case grubb v crane douglas delivered the prevailing opinion of the court in lincoln's favor the exact date of the dissolution of logan and lincoln's partnership is not clear but their names appear together in the case of rogers v dickey argued in november eighteen hundred and forty three and they were opposed to each other in kelly v garrett in march eighteen hundred and forty four so the separation must have taken place some time between these two dates mr herndon says that political rivalry was at the bottom of the dissolution and hints that logan desired the nomination for congress which eventually went to lincoln this may have been so but it is difficult to see how lincoln's nomination in eighteen hundred and forty six could have caused the partners to separate in eighteen hundred and forty four and the fact is that logan himself made the speech which nominated his ex-partner for congress 
fought hard to make him united states senator from illinois and remained his warm friend and supporter as long as he lived the real cause of the dissolution of the firm is to be found in the character and temperament of the two men lincoln was naturally independent and he outgrew the guidance of his preceptor he was a born leader and not a subordinate and it was against his nature to remain in a position of dependence any longer than was necessary therefore the moment he felt strong enough he started out for himself it is however impossible to overestimate the influence which logan exerted upon his associate he laid the foundations upon which lincoln built his legal career and there was no other lawyer in illinois who could have given him anything like the same incentive and training indeed there is no legal reputation in the state to-day which is more secure than logan's and time has only confirmed the judgment of his peers the hon david davis after ten years experience as circuit judge and fifteen years service on the bench of the supreme court of the united states declared that he was the ablest lawyer he had ever met and his opinion justifies the conclusion that lincoln and his second partnership came into touch with one of the most extraordinary legal minds in the country End of chapter thirteen chapter fourteen of lincoln the lawyer this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org lincoln the lawyer by frederick trevor hill chapter fourteen lincoln the head of a law firm it required no little courage and self-confidence for lincoln to sever his relations with logan for he and his family were entirely dependent upon his earnings and when he left the judge's office he had not strictly speaking a client whom he could call his own until that time he had never been obliged to face the difficulties of building up a practice for he had stepped into an established business when stuart gave him his start in the law and a ready-made clientage awaited him in the partnership with logan doubtless he had strengthened and increased the judge's business but he was not entitled as a matter of right to any definite share of it when he left and the fact that clients cannot be parcelled off like merchandise would have prevented a partition of the patronage in any case of course the retiring member of a law firm is justified in accepting any clients who voluntarily follow him to his new office but there is a delicate professional courtesy to be observed in such matters and lincoln was not the sort of man who would willingly supplant an ex-associate it is not probable therefore that he counted on acquiring any of logan's business when he left him and there is no indication that the two men ever had the slightest misunderstanding over any such question but though he had no business following lincoln had good reasons for believing that he could hold his own in the practice of the law at springfield he had a wide acquaintance in the neighborhood and he was popular with all sorts and conditions of men and he knew himself to be the peer of his competitors at the local bar lincoln was modest modest to the point of humility but he was always properly aware of his own abilities he never boasted of what he could or would accomplish but he did not attempt to discount failure with self-depreciation knowing that excuses have merely a personal interest and that accomplishment makes its own claims he did not challenge events but met them boldly instinctively responding at every crisis to the latent powers within him and in a large measure this was the secret of his success it was in this spirit that he faced the future when he withdrew from the valuable alliance with judge logan he thought he could stand alone and feeling his own strength he was anxious to match himself against his contemporaries relying solely on his own resources there was no assumption of superiority in this it was the natural desire of a strong man with a stout heart but though he believed in himself and made his hazard of new fortunes without misgiving lincoln was neither adventurous nor sanguine by nature 
even as a boy he had not displayed the usual confidence of youth and in his first public address he advised the voters of sangamon county that he was already too familiar with disappointments to be very much chagrined if his aspirations met with defeat he was not exactly despondent but there was a suggestion of fatalism in his mental attitude toward many questions and as he matured and his responsibilities increased he became more and more thoughtful serious and inclined to deep depression indeed at one time just before he joined judge logan he was actually threatened with melancholia induced by a combined attack of engagement fever and malaria and all his life he fought despondency with jest and joke and story winning where most men would have lost humour was the talisman with which he exercised the fretful fiends of doubt and care if lincoln had yielded to his natural tendencies and encouraged self-distrust at the moment of parting with judge logan he could easily have found another partner with a ready-made practice in springfield for there were a number of well-established lawyers who would have been only too glad to make generous terms with logan's ex-associate his days of even quasi dependence were over however and he was ambitious to be the head and front of his own business of course the simplest method of accomplishing this would have been to practise by himself yet had he started out absolutely alone he would have been obliged to undertake all his own office work for law clerks were not easily procured in those days and he was utterly unfitted by nature for coping with small drudgeries moreover it so happened that one of his friends recently admitted to the bar was in need of just the start which a junior partnership provided and it was under these circumstances that he offered william henry herndon the chance of his life it is a curious coincidence that all three of lincoln's partners were like him natives of kentucky but herndon's family had moved to illinois when he was a mere child and his youth had been passed in the neighborhood of springfield he was nine years younger than his senior partner whom he had first encountered on the eventful occasion when lincoln had piloted the gallant steamer talisman in her attempt to force the passage of the sangamon and this accidental meeting led to a closer acquaintance which was turned to friendship through an incident connected with the murder of elijah lovejoy the abolitionist herndon was a student in the college at jacksonville illinois when lovejoy set up his anti-slavery press at alton and began the campaign which resulted in his death at the hands of a mob the crime aroused violent excitement throughout the state indignation meetings were held speeches were made and violent condemnation of the outrage was expressed in every form indeed the jacksonville students voiced their sentiments so openly that herndon's father a pronounced slavery man withdrew his son from the college fearing that his mind would be poisoned by the abolition doctrines but the young man returned to springfield with his opinions already formed and it was undoubtedly his bold anti-slavery utterances at a time when the people of illinois picked their words very carefully on the negro question which cemented his friendship with lincoln like his future partner herndon was first employed as a clerk in a grocery store and although he does not say so in his biography it is highly probable that lincoln procured the position for him as his employer was joshua speed lincoln's most intimate friend moreover despite herndon's silence on the subject there is every reason to suppose that it was lincoln who encouraged his young friend to study law certainly his legal apprenticeship was passed in logan and lincoln's office and under all the circumstances it is not strange that his preceptor should have kept an eye on him and taken the first opportunity to advance his fortunes after his admission to the bar it should be stated however that herndon does not explain the partnership in this fashion but unfortunately he is not the most reliable of chroniclers and there is abundant evidence that he failed to appreciate the situation many years afterward a chicago lawyer quoted lincoln as saying that he had selected herndon supposing him to be a good business man who would keep the office affairs in order but soon discovered that he had no more system than he himself and was in reality a good lawyer thus proving a double disappointment 
herndon ingenuously printed this explanation in his true story of a great life and evidently accepted it with no little complacency but whatever lincoln may have thought of his subordinate's legal attainments in later years and there is some evidence that herndon grew to be a fair lawyer it is not likely that he ever placed much dependence on his orderly habits for he must have been thoroughly acquainted with his shortcomings in this and other respects long before he generously offered him his start in life certainly there never was an office conducted with less method and herndon was the last man in the world who could have set things right it must be admitted however that lincoln would probably have defeated the most capable and persistent of managers in any case for the only method he ever personally introduced into the firm's affairs was the immediate division of all fees which came into his hands giving his partner his share at once if he happened to be present or placing it in an envelope endorsed smith v jones herndon's half if he chanced to be away this was the beginning and the end of office organization as far as the senior partner was concerned despite its slack business methods however the firm of lincoln and herndon met with fair success the junior partner making a good clerical assistant in the drawing of pleadings and the minutiae of procedure and in eighteen hundred and forty four to five the senior partner argued no less than thirty-three appeals before the supreme court an excellent first-year record doubtless he would have been even more successful at the outset had he devoted himself exclusively to the law but in eighteen hundred and forty five he was again a candidate for the congressional nomination and his preparation for the campaign necessarily diverted his attention the election took place in eighteen hundred and forty six and after a sharp contest he was returned by a large majority over peter cartwright the itinerant preacher who had been one of his successful rivals in his first canvass for the legislature and whose grandson he was destined to save from the gallows by a remarkable and dramatic appeal to the jury the partnership of lincoln and herndon did not immediately terminate as a result of his election for congress did not convene until late in the next year and the firm continued in active practice until the senior member left for washington lincoln was then in his thirty-ninth year his life had been eventful his rise from absolute obscurity phenomenal and his influence in his own state and party remarkable but the character of the man is well illustrated in the account which he gave of himself in the congressional dictionary and in view of some of the voluminous memoirs of later members which adorn the modern official directory his contribution is suggestive and instructive it contains just forty-eight words and reads as follows born february twelfth eighteen hundred and nine in hardin county kentucky education defective professional lawyer have been a captain of volunteers in black hawk war postmaster in a very small office four times a member of the illinois legislature and a member of the lower house of congress end of chapter fourteen chapter fifteen of lincoln the lawyer this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org lincoln the lawyer by frederick trevor hill chapter fifteen lincoln the lawyer in congress lincoln took his new honors very simply even a little sadly being elected to congress he wrote though i am grateful to our friends for having done it has not pleased me as much as i expected later he wrote of his experiences i find speaking here and elsewhere about the same thing i am about as badly scared and no worse than i am when i speak in court but unlike the irishman he was fond of telling about whose heart was as valiant as any one's but whose cowardly legs would run away with him at the approach of danger lincoln conquered his timidity and speedily displayed a courage of which no mere politician would have been capable in eighteen forty texas had declared its independence and under the terms of a treaty made with the mexican general santa anna the new republic claimed the east bank of the rio grande 
from source to mouth as its proper and legal boundary it is true that santa anna had made such a treaty but as it was signed while that not too valiant gentleman was a prisoner and in fear of his life his acceptance of his captor's ideas as to boundaries could hardly be regarded as binding on his country especially in view of the fact that mexico had promptly repudiated his alleged treaty and continued the war it was supposed to have settled under ordinary circumstances it is doubtful if the united states would have insisted upon the very questionable title of texas to the area in dispute but the new republic had applied for admission to the union and the provisions of the act admitting it created a temptation which the politicians of the country were unable to resist the pro-slavery party in the national legislature was beginning to need reinforcements especially in the senate and the act conferring statehood upon texas provided that several states might be carved out of the acquired territory and as each new state meant two votes in the senate this legislation promised to offset the admission of free states and keep the dominant party in control then as a sop to the anti-slavery agitators it was solemnly enacted that in such of the new states as lay north of thirty six degrees thirty minutes the missouri compromise line slavery should be absolutely prohibited while in those which lay south of that boundary slavery might exist or might not as the constitutions of the new states provided when it is remembered that no land claimed by texas lay north of thirty six degrees thirty minutes the farcical nature of this concession is apparent but it won enough votes in the presidential campaign to ensure the admission of the proposed new state and the pro-slavery politicians had every incentive to make its dimensions as generous as possible under all the circumstances president polk interpreted his election as a popular mandate to support the texan claims and the moment the state was admitted to the union he ordered the army to occupy the disputed territory and the country accepted the war which followed in an outburst of enthusiasm over the success of our arms such was the situation when lincoln took his seat in congress but although some of his warmest friends were at the front and almost all his constituents approved of the war he would not close his eyes to the facts and refused to be dazzled by military glory there was a great chance for the orator and cheap patriot in the fact that a mere handful of americans was scattering thousands of mexicans in every battle and lincoln was urged to make the most of his opportunity and distinguish himself but although he knew what was expected of him and what alone would satisfy his friends and was well aware that no critic of his country is tolerated while its foes are under arms he refused to compromise with his conscience and fought the government policy with all his might and main then for the first time in his public life his power and training as a lawyer were called into play and in a series of questions which no one but a skilful cross-examiner could have phrased he disposed of the casuistical explanations of the war president polk in his several messages to congress had repeatedly referred to the mexican invasion of our territory and the blood of our fellow-citizens shed on our soil and quoting these statements as his text lincoln introduced his now famous spot resolutions wherein the president was requested to answer eight questions calculated to inform the house whether the particular spot on which the blood of our citizens was shed was or was not at that time our own soil there was no escape for the executive from these questions they were pertinent penetrating and not without a certain grave humour and each was so drawn as to preclude the possibility of equivocation or 
evasion moreover they showed an historical knowledge of the facts which could not be trifled with and no one supporting the governmental policy could possibly have answered them all without being caught in a contradiction resolved by the house of representatives they began that the president of the united states be respectfully requested to inform this house first whether the spot on which the blood of our citizens was shed as in his messages declared was or was not within the territory of spain at least after the treaty of eighteen nineteen until the mexican revolution second whether that spot is or is not within the territory which was wrested from spain by the revolutionary government of mexico third whether that spot is or is not within a settlement of people which settlement existed long before the texas revolution and until its inhabitants fled before the approach of the united states army fourth whether that settlement is or is not isolated from any and all other settlements by the gulf and the rio grande on the south and west and by wide uninhabited regions on the north and east fifth whether the people of that settlement or a majority of them or any of them have ever submitted themselves to the government or laws of texas or of the united states by consent or by compulsion either by accepting office or voting at elections or paying tax or serving on juries or having process served upon them or in any other way sixth whether the people of that settlement did or did not flee from the approach of the united states army leaving unprotected their homes and their growing crops before the blood was shed as in the messages stated and whether the first blood so shed was or was not shed within the enclosure of one of the people who had thus fled from it seventh whether our citizens whose blood was shed as in his messages declared were or were not at that time armed officers and soldiers sent into that settlement by the military order of the president through the secretary of war eighth whether the military force of the united states was or was not so sent into that settlement after general taylor had more than once intimated to the war department that in his opinion no such movement was necessary to the defense or protection of texas no interpolation of a government was ever phrased in more telling questions they were unanswerable and the administration sought safety in silence lincoln soon heard from these spot resolutions his home friends protesting vehemently that he ought not to antagonize the government in the face of a foreign war and his political opponents seizing upon his action to fasten the charge of unpatriotic conduct if not treason on his party but neither reproaches nor aspersions caused lincoln to change his attitude to his friends he explained that he would vote and had always voted for whatever was necessary for the support of the army in the field but the policy which had sent it there was a national disgrace which could not be palliated with self-respect and honor the claim that the war was not aggressive reminded him he declared of the illinois farmer who asserted i ain't greedy bout land i only just wants what jines mine but whigs and democrats alike were carried away by the war enthusiasm even those who did not wholly approve of the government's attitude accepted the result with patriotic satisfaction and it was with keen delight that lincoln saw the administration lose all political advantage from its policy by the whig nomination of the war hero taylor for the presidency which lincoln declared took the democrats on their blind side but though the popularity of his party's candidate was due to achievements in the field the illinois congressman urged his friends not to abate their criticisms of the war or excuse it in any way general taylor was a brave soldier who obeyed orders even when he did not personally approve them he declared but his candidacy did not demand 
an endorsement of the war and any such action would imperil the position of the party in law he wrote to general linder it is good policy never to plead what you need not lest you oblige yourself to prove what you cannot never was a legal maxim more happily paraphrased or more aptly applied even in party politics the keen lawyer is apparent in lincoln's every move the new congressman's activities were not however confined to combating and exposing the administration's policies but quietly and unobtrusively he was working for a cause in which his heart and soul were enlisted as early as eighteen thirty seven while in the illinois legislature he had placed himself upon record as opposing the extension of slavery and favoring its exclusion from the district of columbia and he had not been long in washington before he put his theories to the test here again the mind and hand of a shrewd lawyer are strongly evidenced it was his legal training which taught lincoln the value of collateral attack he knew as a lawyer that an unobtrusive precedent sometimes decides a mighty issue and that it is often good legal tactics to anticipate the coming of great events by establishing the law in some minor litigation doubtless it was with this intent that he quietly prepared his bill for a gradual compensatory emancipation of the slaves in the tiny district of columbia and obtained support for the measure in high quarters how nearly he succeeded in creating this precedent is a matter of history but it was not fated that the far-sighted lawyer should succeed in his skilful move and the measure never came to vote had his manoeuvre been supported it is more than possible that the greatest issue of our time would have been judicially decided instead of being left to the arbitrament of arms at the close of the congressional session lincoln visited new england for the first time making political addresses for taylor at boston dedham roxbury cambridge and other places and his speeches attracted some favorable notice but after a short tour he returned to springfield resolved to retire from politics at the end of his congressional term undoubtedly he could have had a renomination had he so desired but he felt himself pledged not to seek a second term i can say as mr clay said of the annexation of texas he wrote that personally i would not object to a re-election although i thought at the time and still think it would be quite as well to return to the law at the end of a single term if it should happen that nobody else wishes to be elected i could not refuse the people the right of sending me again but to enter myself as a competitor of others or to authorize any one so to enter me is what my word and honor forbid somebody else did however desire to be elected and lincoln heartily seconded judge logan's ambition but logan did not possess his ex-associate's personal charm and only a man of strong personal magnetism could have won for the whigs in that year and the judge was hopelessly defeated in march eighteen forty nine lincoln's official term expired and then for the first and only time in his life he became an applicant for office the post he desired was the commissionership of the general land office in illinois but justin butterfield a fellow member of the bar from chicago was appointed and lincoln was afterward offered and fortunately declined the governorship of oregon returning to springfield in the practice of the law numbering among the clients whom he had acquired in washington no less a person than daniel webster a somewhat authoritative recognition of lincoln as a lawyer End of chapter fifteen chapter sixteen of lincoln the lawyer this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Siobhan McAlpin. Chapter 16. Life on the Illinois Circuit. It has been repeatedly asserted that Lincoln's legal reputation was entirely local, and that he was unknown as a lawyer beyond his immediate neighborhood, 
yet it is a fact that he had no sooner announced his intention to resume practice than he was offered a partnership by mr grant goodrich one of the prominent attorneys of chicago with a wide and lucrative clientage lincoln had an idea however that he was threatened with consumption and fearing that city work would undermine his health he declined the proposal and returned to his old office in Springfield. There is no evidence, except his own, that Herndon maintained anything more than a nominal practice after he was left to his own devices, but nevertheless Lincoln offered to continue the partnership with him on the same generous terms which had governed their original alliance and in the spring of 1849 the firm of Lincoln and Herndon again started in business, with headquarters in a little three-story building on the west side of the public square of Springfield, about where the Myers building now stands. The office was neither pretentious nor commodious, but it met the requirements of the times, and its equipment, though meager, would compare very favorably with that of many a country law office of the present day. Lincoln saw but little of this official workroom, however, for he left all matters of routine and local business to Herndon and devoted himself to circuit work, the most picturesque practice of the law which is recorded in the legal annals of this country illinois in 1849 was divided into nine judicial districts each presided over by a judge who traveled from one county seat to another within his jurisdiction hearing civil and criminal cases and acting as an appellate tribunal for minor causes decided by justices of the peace and during the greater part of the year these judges were continually on their rounds followed by the members of the local bar in early times the condition of the roads forbade the use of wheels and the judge made his trips on horseback accompanied by a cavalcade of lawyers who forded the streams and defied the weather in the interest of their clients making light of the many hardships in their zeal for the profession and forming a gay if not learned company warmly welcomed and honored in every county seat before his election to congress lincoln had been one of the equestrian retinue of the honor samuel treat who at the time presided over the destinies of the eighth judicial circuit and the big leather saddle-bags which carried the lawyer's papers and belongings are in existence to-day but by eighteen forty nine wheels could be used with some comfort in travelling and when lincoln resumed his professional duties a procession of buggies and carryalls marked the progress of the court it was an open and sparsely settled country through which the judge and lawyers journeyed in those days a country almost skirting the wilderness from which it had only been recently reclaimed a new free wind-swept and in many respects beautiful country rich with promise and possibility Vast stretches of wonderful prairie land rolled between the little towns, which served as the centers of government for the respective counties, and so great were the distances that several days were sometimes consumed in traveling from point to point. In 1849, the Eighth Circuit included no less than 14 counties, Sangamon, Taswell, Woodford, McLean, logan dewitt piot champagne vermilion edgar shelby moultrie macon and christian and its dimensions were at least a hundred and ten by a hundred and forty miles Today there are eighteen judges doing duty in the district covered by one justice in the early fifties and it is not surprising that lincoln's attendance on the circuit occupied him at least six months of every year 
not many lawyers devoted themselves to the work as closely as he did some confined their attention to a few counties others travelled half the circuit and others even further but lincoln was the only member of the bar who year after year accompanied the judge through the entire district the custom of riding the circuit was of course born of necessity for in the early days there was not sufficient legal business in any one of the small communities to support a lawyer to say nothing of a law firm people who wanted to begin lawsuits usually sought their advisers in the largest town in their vicinity or waited for the arrival of the circuit judge and the attendant bar when they could look over the field and pick out the most available champion frequently however the local attorneys were retained to prepare the papers with instructions to select a suitable man for the court work when the circuit writing bar arrived on the scene there was therefore an excellent chance of securing good business by constant attendance on the itinerant court and the lawyer who visited all the counties was certain to be more widely known than any of his fellow practitioners at the time of lincoln's second partnership with herndon however such work was more a matter of choice than necessity doubtless the firm could have made a satisfactory income had the senior partner devoted himself to the courts nearest his home and maintained a branch office in the distant counties as the other lawyers did but he liked the freedom of the road and the happiest days of his life were those he passed on these long legal tours travelling the circuit was comparatively comfortable in the fifties but it still lacked something of the luxurious and at times it involved hardships which could be surmounted only by the best of health and spirits the judge and his flock usually started out from the state capital as soon as the roads admitted of travel in the early spring and drove to the nearest county seat on their route at times his honor traveled alone but frequently some member of the bar occupied a seat in his carriage and the other lawyers made their way to the rendezvous as best they could three or more often clubbing together and hiring a conveyance for the trip lincoln sometimes travelled with these small parties but after the first year or so he maintained a horse and buggy of his own both of which were pretty wobbly according to judge weldon with whom they were left when their owner took to the iron steed but illinois railroads connected only the centers of population in the early fifties and the county seats on the eighth circuit were not much more than villages each bore a family resemblance to the other and all were strongly suggestive of the typical new england hamlet the settlement almost invariably clustered around a public square of generous dimensions in the centre of which stood the courthouse a substantial building of brick or stone the square itself was guarded from the high road by a series of wooden hitching rails and teams of all sorts nosed this fence from the opening to the closing of the term for business and pleasure both demanded the attendance of the whole county on court days and shelter for the horses and wagons was frequently unobtainable even the lawyers had difficulty in finding accommodation for their animals and as the supply of labor was extremely limited those who traveled in private rigs often had to be their own holstlers the stable facilities however were not infrequently superior to those of the hotels sometimes the tiny taverns which attempted to house the visitors boasted only one habitable room and as this was invariably reserved for the judge the lawyers not included in this hospitality had to sleep anywhere they could on the sofas the tables the window seats the floor and even in the lofts and horse stalls it was no uncommon thing for his honor to invite three or four men to occupy his room but the one who was selected to share judge davis's bed might about as well have slept on the floor 
for that jurist was almost as wide as the ordinary four-poster. Lincoln and he made a fair average as far as width was concerned, but as the former was six feet four and had to lie crosswise to fit in the average bed, their combination was not a pronounced success. In the dining room, the tavern keeper usually reserved one end of the table for the bar, and the judge was always expected to preside at the head of the board. But the function was frequently a barmecide feast, and, as Lincoln remarked, there was very little advantage in sitting at the head of the table unless the food improved as you moved up. Except for this distinction as to place, there was no difference made between the legal fraternity and the other guests of the hotel, and litigants, witnesses, jurors, and prisoners out on bail were accommodated at the same table and enjoyed the same fare. Indeed, Mr. Whitney recalls several persons actually on trial who not only took their meals with his honor and the bar, but also spent their evenings in the judge's room without the slightest embarrassment to any one. The inconvenience and discomforts of the life were at times almost unbearable, but Lincoln was never known to join in the frequent protests and complaints of his associates. Indeed, his sense of humor often saved the situation and made it tolerable, if not enjoyable, for himself and others. He saw the comic side of all that irritated men of more nervous temperament, and disposed of annoyances with a laugh so hearty and infectious that even the disgruntled victims of petty misfortunes had to join in his mirth. In an indolent, easy manner, he studied the various types of human nature encountered on the road, took a direct personal interest in the people he met, and made friends at every stopping place. All the court clerks and county officials were glad to see him come and sorry to have him depart. He had a warm welcome at every tavern door, and all sorts and conditions of men claimed his close acquaintance. But, despite this general popularity, Lincoln was not, as he has frequently been depicted, an irresponsible hail-fellow-well-meant, familiarly known as Abe, who went about slapping people on the back and encouraging similar salutations nothing could be further from the truth than this judge weldon informed the writer that in all his acquaintance with lincoln on the circuit the only person he ever heard address him by his first name was a street urchin whose impertinence astonished the future president quite as much as it amused him and there is no reason to believe that he courted such familiarities after he reached maturity Certainly, his correspondence shows that he almost invariably addressed people by their last names, even his most intimate friends like Speed and Davis. And although Herndon relates anecdotes in which he figures as Billy, Lincoln's letters refer to him as Herndon or William, although he was a much younger man than his partner and something of a protege. This is not at all suggestive of the arm-around-the-neck familiarity with which Lincoln is credited, and, as a matter of fact, he admitted very few friends to his confidence, and his intimates never numbered more than two or three. He was undoubtedly easygoing, pleasant-spoken, cordial, unconventional, and entirely approachable but he had his own distinctive barrier of dignity which no one ever surmounted. It is easy to understand the fascination of the circuit life. The members of the bar formed a bright, congenial company who strove mightily with each other in the courtrooms, but ate and drank as friends. They were persons of credit and renown in the eyes of all the assembled countryside, oracles to the political gossips, and leaders of public opinion whose words were often law. Every man knew every other man, 
and the close daily contact in the courtrooms and on the road created a spirit of comradeship which no mere professional interest could supply there was little of dull routine in the life less of cold formality nothing of the anxieties and cares which characterize modern practice and the play instinct which few men ever entirely outgrow was strongly in evidence at every term of court one group of the merry company founded a mock tribunal which formulated all sorts of ridiculous charges against their fellow practitioners and tried the offenders with burlesque pomp and severity to the delight of all beholders others were good at song and story and many of the evenings passed in the judge's private room were all-night sessions of mirth and good fellowship which made for lasting friendship and an esprit de corps destined to have a marked effect upon more than one career the whole atmosphere of the profession favored individuality self-expression and development and lincoln responded to all these encouraging influences he was distinctly a human product and his growth of mind and character was most happily fostered by the free life of the circuit where he was in close touch with a vigorous independent unartificial people drawn from every part and class of the country and all representatively american theirs was the force which really moulded the man at the formative period of his career and the most important individual influence on his future may be fairly ascribed to the judge before whom he practised and with whom he virtually lived for ten successive years End of chapter sixteen Chapter 17 of Lincoln, the Lawyer. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kirk Hendrick, Trinity, Florida. Lincoln, the Lawyer by Frederick Trevor Hill. Chapter 17 Judge Davis and Lincoln. Judge David Davis was a lawyer of marked ability and strong individuality, a shrewd businessman, a loyal friend, a violent partisan of generous impulses and deep-rooted prejudices, an arbitrary and even despotic ruler of his own domain, but a fearless administrator of the law and absolutely honest and capable judge. He and Lincoln had met as lawyers in Springfield, but there does not appear to have been any intimacy between them until lincoln resumed practice at the close of his congressional term when their acquaintance speedily developed into a friendship of enduring quality and historic importance the relations of the bench and the bar were necessarily much closer in the early fifties than they are today and the lawyers of the eighth circuit were practically a big family of which davis was the official head and over which he exerted a real parental influence not only did his honors ample girth and other physical proportions suggest a paterfamilias but his mental attitude toward the bar was at once domineering and fatherly with the domineering element always prominent he used to remind me of a big schoolmaster with a lot of little boys at his heels whenever i saw him stumping toward the courthouse remarks a now distinguished lawyer and it cannot be denied that there was a good deal of pedagogue about the judge certainly he knew how to maintain order in his court but there was always more tact than severity in his enforcement of discipline. Mr. Sheriff, you will see that nobody except General Linder is allowed to smoke in my court, was his method of administering a rebuke to an attorney general of Illinois. The hints of the kind of seldom went astray. But though he insisted upon maintaining the dignity of his office upon every proper occasion, he dispensed with all unnecessary etiquette, and outside the courtroom he was democratic, to the last degree almost every man woman and child in the fourteen counties of his circuit knew judge davis and he undoubtedly was personally acquainted with a greater number of residents than any other one man in the district it naturally followed that he knew the jurors who were selected by the sheriff and in some counties the same men composed the jury term after term they were his friends 
but the idea that they would be subservient to his wishes on this account or that he would attempt to take advantage of their friendship to impose his authority upon them never apparently entered anyone's head on the contrary he relied on the intelligence fairness and integrity of the talesman to far greater extent than is practical in modern courts but if there was the slightest cause for suspecting that a litigant would not receive an impartial verdict at their hands he promptly removed the case into another circuit and he governed himself by the same strict rules which he applied to the juries in the minutes of the court in tazewell county the writer discovered a significant entry evidently in davis's handwriting written opposite the case of hall v woodward reading somewhat as follows jury disagreed venue changed on account of the prejudice of the judge but though he was impartial in all his official duties his honor was a man of strong likes and dislikes and he took no pains to conceal his feelings toward the different members of the bar lincoln leonard sweat judge logan and a few others continually bask in the sunshine of his approval but lincoln was the prime favorite of the privileged clique which made the judge's room its headquarters and almost from the first he was distinguished at every possible opportunity in a way which would have been fatal to the average man more than one of the judge's coterie has testified that his honor would brook no interpretation of the conversation when lincoln had the floor and if his favorite happened to be absent he took but little interest or enjoyment in the rest of the company which gathered at his rooms where is lincoln he would inquire irritably here somebody go and tell lincoln to come here under such circumstances it is nothing short of remarkable that the man was not loathed instead of loved by the rank and file of the profession he was naturally unassuming but until he came into contact with judge davis he had never placed in a position of much power davis however recognized the master quality of his mind and his views and arguments soon began to have more weight and influence with the court than those of any other member of the bar his honor had too much individuality and independence actually to defer to any one else's opinion but his favorite always had the ear of the court and this in itself gave him a commandingly important position it is easy for the weak to be gentle writes a distinguished student of human nature most people can bear adversity but if you wish to know what a man really is give him power that is the supreme test no one but an experienced lawyer can appreciate the immense power wielded by the advocate on whom the bench relies the mere fact that he has a private ear of the court is in itself a temptation which has proved too much for more than one distinguished member of the bar and though the judge be never so honest and impartial there are countless forms in which a personal equation may be invoked the average practitioner who occupies this post of vantage seldom makes an effort to guard himself against the misuse of his opportunities he does not hesitate to arrogate to himself small licenses which he knows will not be denied he crowds and overbears adversaries less fortunately situated and generally asserts himself at their expense every courtroom in the world harbors these privileged bullies not all of them of course make a brutal display of their powers many are extremely civil in bringing the necessary pressure to bear and some are so mentally constituted that they are not conscious of exerting any offensive influence against their fellow practitioners but in ninety-nine cases out of a hundred the leaders of the bar yield to temptations which lincoln resisted and few have ever been tested as he was yet he worked in an atmosphere of this sort for ten years schooling himself against the open favor of the court in such training and temptations there came to the nation's guidance a master of infinite tact not only did he refrain from imposing himself upon his contemporaries but younger members of the profession received every possible consideration at his hands it is a universal testimony of those who met him in daily practice that he never wantonly sought to exalt himself at the expense of a fellow practitioner and his juniors constantly retained him to aid them in cases without the slightest fear that he would attempt to overshadow them take the credit for victory or shelve responsibility for defeat the first case i ever had in tazewell county was a people versus gideon hawley remarked mr james hayes while talking with the writer 
there were thirty-two indictments against my client for obstructing a public road and as the authorities were inclined to make an example the case was somewhat serious i retained mr lincoln to conduct the defense and after we had completed our preparations he said of course you will make the opening speech i was surprised for i had supposed that he would want to assume full control and i said as much adding that i would prefer him to take the lead no he answered and then laying a hand on my shoulder he continued i want you to open the case and when you are doing it talk to the jury as though your client's fate depends on every word you utter forget that you have any one to fall back upon and you will do justice to yourself and your client i have never forgotten the kind gentle and tactful manner in which he spoke those words mr haynes continued and that is a fair sample of the way he treated younger members of the bar this with other testimony of a similar nature shows the man in the making and no one who is familiar with lincoln's subsequent conduct as commander-in-chief of the army can fail to recognize the bearing of his professional training upon his official actions again and again he assumed all responsibility for the blunders of his generals and it will be remembered that when grant succeeded he instantly wrote him not only disclaiming any share of the credit but acknowledging that the executive had doubted the wisdom of his plans judge davis's confidence in lincoln's ability was evidenced at all times but it often took a form which must appear nothing less than amazing to the modern practitioner for he frequently assigned lincoln to the bench and left him to conduct the court in his absence there has been considerable doubt expressed by some biographers as to whether or not lincoln did actually preside in a judiciary capacity but there is not the slightest question about the matter judge weldon informed the writer that he personally tried a jury case with lincoln on the bench and mr whitney asserts that the future president once conducted an entire term of court in campaign county moreover there is in existence to-day a judgment in lincoln's handwriting which he was written by him in a case which he presided as the trial judge this practice was of course irregular and it is said that two cases were reversed by the supreme court because of it but judge weldon told the writer that lincoln never presided at trial unless the attorneys for both parties consented and that they were generally glad to do so for in this way delays were avoided and the clients and witnesses accommodated when davis was unable to hold court the unofficial character of the position however made great demands upon lincoln's tact and he had to display rare judgment in exercising his authority on one such occasion some young attorneys attempted to embarrass him with technical devices in a case in which there was no real defense lincoln heard them with the utmost good nature and patience and finally when they had kept up their tactics for a whole day he gave a decision in favor of the plaintiff and wrote the direction for judgment in such form that there was no possible chance for an appeal but how are we to get this up to the supreme court asked one of the attorneys when he found himself cornered well you've all been so smart about this case answered lincoln calmly that you could find out for yourselves how to carry it up and that ended the matter lincoln's earnestness and sense of responsibility deepened as he found himself relied upon as the leader of the bar and as the years went by he grew more and more grave meditative and given to mental abstraction he would frequently lapse into reverie and remain lost in thought long after the rest of us had retired for the night judge weldon told the writer and more than once i remember waking up in the morning to find him sitting before the fire his mind apparently concentrated on some subject and with the saddest expression i have ever seen in human beings eyes no one knows with what thoughts lincoln was struggling in those hours but this side of his character had almost disappeared under the mass of silly stories which are coupled with his name one would think to read some of the biographies that he never had a serious moment and that most of his life on the circuit was spent in retailing dubious stories to gapping circles of country folk at wayside taverns indeed one chronicle states that he was frequently pitted against a local champion raconteurs in storytelling tournaments which continued for days but which never could have lasted long enough to furnish all the pointless jest which seek to illustrate his fame as a fun-maker
Lincoln was a wit, and as Ingersoll said, he used any word which wit could disinfect, but his reputation has suffered at the hands of writers who have employed stories as stopgaps in their information. Of course, it is far easier and more amusing to attribute a lively story to Lincoln than to give a true picture of the man. But the compilations which have been evolved on this principle, and which picture his life on a circuit as a round of storytelling, are made of whole cloth, some of which is stolen goods. Nothing can be more absurd than to picture Lincoln as a combination of buffoon and drummer, protested one of his surviving contemporaries while discussing the subject with the writer. He was frequently the life of our little company, keeping us good-natured, making us see the funny side of things, and generally entertaining us. But to create the impression that this circuit was a circus of which Lincoln was the clown is ridiculous. He was a lawyer engaged in serious and dignified work, and a man who felt his responsibility keenly. Probably there is no one living who is better entitled to speak on his subject than Mr. James Ewing, a member of the Illinois Bar, whose father kept the old National Hotel in Bloomington, where all the lawyers used to stop while on the circuit, and at whose house Lincoln boarded after the hotel was closed. Mr. Ewing was about nine years old when Lincoln first stayed at the National, and for six or seven years afterward he saw and heard him in the company of his associates almost every term of court. In all my experience, Mr. Ewing informed the writer, I never heard Mr. Lincoln tell a story for its own sake or simply to raise a laugh. He used stories to illustrate a point, but the idea that he sat around and matched yarns like a commercial traveler is utterly false. I never knew him do such a thing and I had ample opportunity for noting him. Lincoln would soon have become a bore if he had traded on his storytelling gifts, remarked another authority. He traveled with the same men day after day, week after week, and month after month. Even if his fun of antidotes could have stood the strain, we should not have been able to endure it, for no man exhausts himself or others so quickly as a professional funny man. But those who have depicted Lincoln on the circuit as a sort of end man with an itinerant menstrual show, have also done a similar injustice to Davis. More than one scissors and paste pot biography encourages the inference that it was Davis's partiality for broad stories which caused him to distinguish Lincoln, and we are expected to believe that this was the edifying origin of the friendship of these two distinguished men. Undoubtedly, Davis enjoyed a good story, and it may well be conceded that his laugh was as loud and infectious as tradition says it was. But to suppose that a man of his ability would select a mere jester for a friend, or that Lincoln would have consented to serve as a court fool, is preposterous. Davis had precisely the mental qualities which were best adapted to encourage and develop a man of Lincoln's temperament. He recognized his great ability, admired his modesty, respected his integrity, esteemed his judgment, and helped to school his legal aptitude. He knew the power of the man, knew it through ten years' association with him in a courtroom, and it was this knowledge, gained in this way, which formulated his unconquerable belief in the Illinois candidate for the presidential nomination. It was Judge Davis and a handful of men who had learned to know and appreciate Lincoln as a lawyer, a small group of his fellow practitioners on the Eighth Circuit, Davis, the judge, Sweat, the advocate, and Logan, the leader of the bar, but especially Davis, who forced Lincoln upon the Chicago Convention in 1860, and thus gave him to the nation. End of chapter 17《Chapter 18 of Lincoln the Lawyer. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Lincoln the Lawyer by Frederick Trevor Hill. Chapter 18 Leader of the Bar. Lincoln did not return to any assured clientage at the close of his congressional term and he had his professional reputation still to make 
when he began to follow judge davis over the circuit he had had a fairly wide acquaintance in the community before he went to washington but the state was rapidly increasing in population and to the newcomers he was of course an utter stranger even to the majority of the old inhabitants he was better known as a stump speaker and politician than as a lawyer and recognizing this he set to work with a singleness of purpose which had not previously characterized his interest in the law we have his own word for it that he had then definitely determined to abandon public life and his most intimate professional associates testified to a marked change in his attitude toward his work from this time on thenceforward he bent all his energies upon equipping himself for his legal duties preparing his cases with greater care fortifying himself with reading and generally becoming more systematic in his studies it was probably at this time that he began entering notes of cases and authorities in a memorandum book which he carried with him on the circuit and which provided him with a ready reference at moments when it was not possible to procure law reports or textbooks his preparation however did not stop at legal learning he began the study of the german language and was interested in anything which could develop his mind and he did not abandon any subject once he touched upon it in the course of my reading he told a friend years afterward i constantly came across the word demonstrate i thought at first that i understood its meaning but soon became satisfied that i did not i consulted webster's dictionary that told me of certain proof beyond the probability of doubt but i could form no idea of what sort of proof that was i consulted all the books of reference i could find but with no better results you might as well have defined blue to a blind man at last i said to myself lincoln you can never make a lawyer if you do not know what demonstrate means and so i worked until i could give any proposition of the six books of euclid at sight i then found out what demonstrate meant this study was performed at odd intervals while he was engaged in trial work on the circuit and herndon reports that he frequently saw lincoln poring over his euclid by candlelight at night in his bedroom where three or four other men were sleeping after a hard day's work in the courts it was discipline of this quality which developed and strengthened the man's mind at his most critical period and his growth as a lawyer followed as a natural result though he himself never made the slightest claim to legal eminence i am only a mast fed lawyer he once protested meaning that his mind had not been nourished with the sort of educational provender which rounds out the ribs of aptitude and this recognition of his deficiencies redoubled his efforts at one time he had apparently thought that his ability as a speaker would carry him through but doubtless his experience with logan and other able lawyers taught him to mistrust his powers in this respect and his advice to some law students written in july eighteen fifty shows his altered attitude extemporaneous speaking should be practised and cultivated he remarked it is the lawyer's avenue to the public however able and faithful he may be in other respects people are slow to bring him business if he cannot make a speech and yet there is not a more fatal error than relying too much on speech-making if any one upon his rare powers of speaking shall claim an exemption from the drudgery of the law his case is a failure in advance but even with close application to business and the unmistakable favor of the court lincoln did not rise to any immediate recognition at the bar 
his ability was of slow growth and there was nothing showy or impressive about his practice in the courts little by little however it began to dawn upon the local public that he was the most uniformly effective man of all those who practised on the circuit not only with the court but with the juries but it was the lawyers who first evidenced the discovery by retaining him to try cases for them the confidence and appreciation of his competitors is the highest compliment which any lawyer can receive and it was this professional recognition which largely determined lincoln's subsequent career for it enabled him to leave all the minutiae of practice and the drudgery of preparation to other lawyers and to devote himself almost exclusively to trial work the result was that although he had probably a wider acquaintance than any other practitioner on the circuit he had comparatively few personal clients most of his business coming through other attorneys who either retained him of their own initiative or at the suggestion of the litigants indeed his reputation as an advocate became such that some attorneys advertised themselves as his partners but this merely meant that they usually retained him to try their cases or possibly that they had some general understanding with him that he would act as counsel for them during certain terms of court or in particular counties it thus frequently happened that lincoln knew nothing of either his cause or his client until he arrived at the county seat where the trial was to be held and as a term of court seldom lasted more than a few days he had very little opportunity to prepare himself if the local attorney who retained him had an office he made that his headquarters but if as often happened there was no such accommodation available the necessary consultations took place in the tavern usually in the judge's private room and regardless of his honour's presence frequently however the conference was held out of doors to avoid interruptions and it was no uncommon thing for lincoln to be seen seated on the ground under the shade of some convenient tree in the court-house square consulting with his associates their clients and witnesses of course important litigations were not prepared in this haphazard fashion but very few lawsuits in those days were complicated and both sides usually wanted a prompt trial of the matter in dispute this class of work naturally brought lincoln into close touch with all sorts of men and women and trained him to be a quick and unerring judge of character each case was a distinct problem replete with human nature and it was doubtless this constant insight into the springs and sources of human action which developed his instinctive understanding of the people and taught him to anticipate and lead popular opinion as no other public man in this country had ever done it is probable that lincoln tried more cases between eighteen forty nine and eighteen sixty than any other man on the eighth circuit he was the acknowledged leader of the local bar whose services were constantly in demand and the one man who could be relied upon to take a case in any of the counties comprising the circuit for he alone covered the entire route it is misleading to belittle the value of this daily experience on the ground that most of the litigations were of no great monetary importance every lawyer familiar with trial work knows that small cases often raise more difficult questions of law and demand nicer knowledge of legal principles than causes on which millions depend and it should also be remembered that many of the small suits were in effect test cases which settled the law for the new state of course no one could have practised before the court and juries day after day and year after year in this way without learning something and lincoln's legal development was marked with every year of his practice in eighteen fifty three the illinois central railroad retained him as its counsel and not long afterward he appeared for the rock island road and many other important representative interests and his record of appeal cases in the supreme court is equal 
by but few members of the illinois bar it is impossible to overestimate the value of these active professional years on lincoln's subsequent career they brought him into close contact and collision with able lawyers of every calibre with men of force and strong character men whose business it was to reason persuade cajole and intimidate others to their way of thinking and who employed every device from legitimate argument to brutal terrorizing to accomplish their ends the most capable layman is no match for the trained attorney in an argument and a man who is familiar with the law can often silence and overawe an intellectual superior who is not armed with similar knowledge every lawyer of experience has seen business men of courage and conviction hesitate vacillate and practically disintegrate under legal menace and coercion and all readers of the history of this country know that more than one occupant of the white house armed with authority but unskilled in the ways of the law has been cowed into practical abdication by tactics familiar to all frequenters of the courts lincoln's daily antagonists were such men as logan stuart baker browning oglesby sweat scott cullum and palmer men drawn from all parts of the country who later distinguished themselves as judges congressmen senators or governors of states and besides these and others of equal brilliancy he met different types and grades of the profession well qualified to prepare him for the great cause which was soon to be entrusted to his care long before he was called to washington his daily life in the courts had familiarized him with the roarers and bulldozers of the profession with the sly and tricky gentry who worked by indirection with the untrustworthy treacherous and unscrupulous practitioner with the broad-minded advocate and the narrow bigoted partisan years before he encountered them in his cabinet he had met such men as stanton and seward and chase and where a man of less experience or other training would have quarrelled with them or been himself torn apart in their struggles for supremacy he handled them with the sure touch of command and made them work together for the nation stanton utterly failed to take lincoln's measure in the mccormick reaper case hereafter referred to but lincoln took his and years afterward when the great war secretary attempted to bulldoze the administration the patient executive stood unmoved by his roaring and employed his fanatical egotism to the best possible advantage chase played for the presidency on the cabinet board thinking his masked moves would escape the indolent attention of the masked fed lawyer and suddenly found himself checked and manoeuvred into a speedy resignation and history has disclosed the fact that seward one of the most distinguished members of the new york bar unwittingly received more than one lesson in law at the hands of the tactful executive End of chapter eighteen